Thank you so much. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. I want to thank in particular Emma and Jose for getting me here. Um, they've been treating me like royalty. I've been getting all the <laughs> seafood treats and showing up, showed me around. So I already have a good sense of the city, I think. It's just the weather. That's all my fault. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, now that I'm getting taped, I will spare some of the dirty stuff, okay? You will not get the dirty background stories that I was all, that I had prepared, so it's, that's the fault of the taping, but I'll try to do my best to explain. I don't think we can explain that process, um, but I'll try to do my best. Um, I thought it might be good to just start with why would you even care to get published in a top tier journal? It's a lot of work. Why would you even bother? <laughs> I don't know how much it's valued in Spain. I hear that it's getting more and more important. Um, and I was just thinking back about when I started to get into this kind of um, publishing process, if you will. And at the time, I don't think I really realized how important it is. It was almost like a kid getting a gold sticker, a gold star sticker. I don't know if you have that kind of thing. Like in the US, it's often, if you did something really great, you get a gold star sticker. I think that's what I was going for at the time, and I didn't realize really how important it is. It has opened so many doors in, in Germany. I wouldn't get um, as good as a job. In the States, you get the red carpet. I got wonderful offers in the United States, and I did not realize that the Gold Star sticker would do that much for me. I think I was just being ambitious. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Let's try if I can do this, but it really has big time implications. You make an impact. You get, you get more money, you get more freedom, at least in the United States. So it's not just that gold star sticker that I, and I did not understand at the time how big it really is for your career, for yourself, that you get invited to Spain and all the wonderful things. But, um, so maybe that as, as a bit of a background and to highlight the importance. It is very difficult and just to understand that it will do a lot for you if you manage to publish in these journals. I think that's sort of a, caveat to, to preface all this. Um, so I'm trying here to highlight already, um, I think the talk title was Insights from the Editor. <laughs> I'm like grinning about this because I think a lot of the insights really come from a variety of perspectives. Um, the author perspective is one, the review perspective is one, and then of course the editor perspective is one. So I think you learn a lot from all these different angles. Um, and I tell people, the best thing to do is review away. Review as much as you can. You learn all the time. You learn from others' mistakes. You'd rather learn from their mistakes as opposed to um, learning the hard way, making all the mistakes yourself. Um, so I think it's great if you can use that perspective, so to speak. Are you taping me as well? That's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> there, there, it's, it's available somewhere. So. I'll try, I'll try to focus on what I'm saying while I'm being taped here. Um, so I think you learn a lot if you can review because you see so much. I've got, I, I received a lot of ideas from reviewing. You see trends that are happening already before they, these things get published. So you see already where the field is moving if you review a lot. So, um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm an editor and I want you guys to review. I'm, it's honestly a big advantage for you if you review because you learn so much. Um, I think it also offers a lot of prestige in the long run because you then will get invited to editorial boards. So that work that you put in there also pays off, at least in the United States. That's very prestigious if you are invited to an editorial board. And initially you might feel like, hey, why would I review? Nobody will see the work that I'm doing. You're not, maybe you get a little listing of your name at the end of the year in the journal, but nobody reads it. So you might feel like, why would I even care to put my time in that, into that? But I think you, it's, it's a big payoff because you learn a lot, you see where everything is going, and you end up being invited to be an editor, which I had not anticipated at the time. I had not thought of that. So um, being an editor, uh, being a reviewer is, I think, a very important part of where all these experiences come from. And that has really helped me a lot to, to be successful in this, as Emma calls it, game <laughs> um, of getting published. Well, and of course, author. The author part is really the hardest thing. So I was thinking, how do, how do you get into this business? There's, 
the hard way of learning the stuff, <laughs> there's the easier way of learning the stuff. So the reviewer part is learning it the easier way because you get to observe, you can be the critical bystander, oh, this doesn't look right. So this, and when, when you are neutral and you're just looking at someone else's work, it's so much easier to see the mistakes and that helps you hopefully to prevent them. Um, but I'm also hoping that if, if I'm assuming things when I, when I talk and chat about these things, where do I'm, I'm now trying to reconsider, I don't know whether you are all involved in this process already or whether maybe you guys don't do a whole lot of that in Spain, so I'm not trying, okay, let's see. Maybe there's not a whole lot of reviewing happening in Spain. So maybe take a step back um, and um, just go through some basics. Uh, so peer review anonymously, obviously, um, as an author and as a reviewer, you would know who is the author um, or who is the reviewer, so it's blind review, and only the editor really knows who, who is who in that game, so to speak. Um, so, so if anything is unclear, or you want me to take a step back, okay. any particular interests, you just need to let me know, okay? We're all in this together. <laughs> Make sure I'm talking um, the right way about the questions that you might have. Um, so that's the background, all these different sort of three angles, if you will, author, reviewer, editor. Um, so this is how I was going to talk through the various um, aspects of it. So you want to plan your project accordingly, theory, method, formal appearance, style, dealing with feedback, and concluding comments. And if you have a question, interrupt me at any point. I have two kids, so <laughs> I have no trouble with being interrupted at all. Um, all right, so the first thing, um, I often encounter what I, what I, I don't think I have a real good label for it, but oftentimes I might have a new student, a doctoral student who has written his master's thesis or her master's thesis at another institution and then he's coming to our institution and the person might go like, okay, I've done my master's thesis, now I want to get this published in a good journal. I've worked my butt off <laughs> um, to get this master thesis project done and it feels like the biggest thing that has ever happened on earth <laughs> and I want to get this published. And oftentimes the master thesis is really just a step on the way to learn how to do it. So master thesis, doctoral thesis, or dissertations oftentimes not at the right level. You really need to plan the whole project to be publishable in a way. Um, and that might be, I think from, I'm trying to think of the German experience that I bring to the table, which is, I guess, similar to when you're trying to publish out of Spain. Um, you are in a very different system, the way the writing functions, the whole academic system is different. So I'm trying to um, remember how that is when you're in a, in a system that is not very well embedded. The Germans are, I guess, similar in that regard, in the international publication game, arena, or whatever. Um, because in the States, you try to plan your projects to get published. Thesis often don't work out that way because they're still learning. The students are just learning things um, as they go, as they write these um, projects. So I think the first thing to keep in mind, where do I want to go with this? Which journals are you looking at? Maybe you have, let's say you have an interest. Um, I would probably think about where would I want this published? What is maybe the most similar piece that that, is, uh, that resembles what I'm interested in, could I maybe build on that? Could it be similar to that? Because it's really hard to come with all your creativity <laughs> and then convince reviewers, hey, this is the right way to do it, and this is a really important project and topic, and convince this whole field of reviewers, this whole network, that this is important. I think it's much easier if you build on something that is already there. It will have that, oh, I know what this person's talking about effect you will get that effect if you're building on something that is already out there. Um, so I think it's easier if you're, I don't want to say mimic, <laughs> it's a really negative word, way of framing it, but if you're building off of something that is already published in these, in these journals, I think it will be easier for you. So use, use some sort of model, if you will. Like in my case, I remember 
Um, the mood management tradition, those experiments that Zillman did, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that was sort of my template. And I, I wanted to extend that and use a different way of talking about mood regulation with media. So that was sort of my template and I used some of the, the, the research, the methods, um, and extended it with a different angle a little bit. And that was just helpful. Um, I don't know if I'm at all <laughs> working with this, yeah, let me just maybe, so that I make sure that I'm talking about all the things that I had in mind. So I think it's important to start with where is this going? Where will I publish this? Who will be reviewing this? Or, um, who are the readers? Uh, who are the reviewers of this project once I want to publish this? Um, so you need to think about the relevance. Are you filling some sort of gap in the existing literature? And the thing that jumps at me when I think about what you could possibly pursue is um, cross-cultural comparisons. I think that would make it the, that's probably the easiest route. Use something that's already out there in those journals, have a little twist to it, and then see if it works similarly in the Spanish context. That would be an easy way. It's not super innovative, but it's probably a good way to get the foot in the door. Um, so one thing is to be just realistic. It, if you want to be super creative, that might be a lot harder to convince people that this is a good way of doing it. Um, I think it's much easier if, if they recognize, OK, this is the logic. This is familiar. That will make it easier for you to get it published, to convince reviewers. It's very much a persuasive act that you are engaging in. You're marketing your research. So you need to convince these folks, this is good, this is important, it's sound work. Um, so that sort of perspective, that the ultimate goal is to persuade people that this is good work. So take a persuasive attitude <laughs> in a way. Um, so here are some, some thoughts that I had, how you could sort of complement the existing research, other populations. So. Um, in Spain, other methodology. If people have always studied something with survey methodology, maybe you want to do an experiment or a focus group approach or something along these lines. Um, maybe there are inconsistencies in the existing findings. So these could all be angles um, to, to work uh, towards um, explaining the gap that you're filling. I want to catch my breath. I think it needs to have an additional angle. So it should not be just a replication, if you will, in, in this country. There needs to be a different, an additional component to it, I think. Um, but sometimes, if that angle does not work out, maybe you'll just drop that from the write-up that you will submit, for instance. Because your project could be a little larger if you will submit the whole baby, <laughs> the whole deal is a different. Um, story. Um, so you're wondering, is it for a doctor student exciting enough to take something that's already out there? Um, so I don't mean um, I don't mean to say copy what's out there, but very strongly build on something that is already published in those journals, as opposed to, well, I don't know the Spanish research enough. If if it's all building on what's only happening in Spain, it will be difficult. So, but of course, I mean. That's the other thing. If you are no longer excited about what you're doing, it's not worth it. <laughs> so I'll also say that. It's, it's, if you're sort of sacrificing everything that you're interested in to pursue this goal, that sounds like a terrible life plan. <laughs> so I wouldn't go that far, if you will. No other questions, comments, maybe an example or something. Um, so yeah, here's the, the whole innovation versus more of the same. Maybe um, to give you an example of, of that sort of, I don't know if there is even balance to that, but I, I think we were talking a little bit about it. If um, in my research field, um, the, the phenomenon that people prefer messages that align with their attitudes is a well-studied phenomenon. Um, I keep publishing in that domain. It's very easy. <laughs> I'm not particularly excited about it, <laughs> but there's 
little tweaks you can add here and there, source credibility and uh, cross-cultural comparison and online or print, how do all these things work together. It's, it's relatively easy to publish. Um, and I get my students published, which is important to me. I want them to get jobs. Um, but then other areas that I also work in, gender representations, how it affects people, much harder. Even though it might be so much more important, very few people do it, and it breaks my heart that it's so much harder. But there needs to be a balance, I guess. If you want to get published, if you want to get your trajectory the same, at the same level, you probably need to strike a good balance. What will be easy to publish, or, well, you can at least foresee that it's going to go relatively well, and then maybe afford more innovativeness, if you will, where it's probably more difficult. Of course, you cannot just copy things. Don't, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> building on something that's already out there is usually easier. So, I don't, if you want to tell me about experiences, or if that reflects what you've we're faced with or I think we have a case. First we do the project and then we have a vision of publication. No. We start with publication. Yeah, I think first that's important. Research, and then where can yeah. we yeah, and it, it, it should be. The, that sounds like the right way. You want to solve a societal problem, but then you run into issues later on if you want to get that thing out there. It's, it's then hard. I think you need to think already about that challenge, if you will, and hopefully still address societal problems. That would be nice. <laughs> you know, you don't want to lose that aspect of work. So keep, keep telling me what, whatever comes to your mind. So I'm more than happy to have a conversation more than just me talking. Um, theory, 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 theory. <laughs> I torture my students every day with that. Um, so a lot of my projects at least start with some intuitive observation, something that makes me curious about something. But if I cannot draw strongly on theory, I know it's not going to go anywhere big, <laughs> so to speak. So you want to have maybe even several um, theoretical perspectives. I, th I think it's particularly exciting if you can test different theories through competing hypotheses, then it gets particularly interesting. Um, of course, you will always be on thin ice if the reviewers that you encounter like the theory you picked. Sometimes they ask you, why don't you use that one? And it may even be interchangeable depending on what theories you're looking at. Sometimes they work almost the same way with the predictions, but you need to think about theories. So every, every evening, read some theory thing, if you will. Keep reading. It's, make it your hobby if you can. Um, so you need to think about theory. That's the other big. Without theory, you're not going anywhere, at least not in the big journals, if you will. Um, and another important um, way of adding um, to theoretical insights is um, that you're not just showing effects in your empirical work, that you can also explain why something is happening. Um, you need to have, it depends on the area of the, of the work, but if you're just replicating some sort of effect, people might not be particularly intrigued. But if you can explain why exactly it's happening, that's a big bonus. Um, sometimes it's not even it's not possible, but you want to think about, can I explain why something is happening? Let me give you an example. We did one study um, that really started with, um, hey, that would be so cool if we could demonstrate that. So we were thinking, what would be the coolest thing that we could demonstrate that magazines do to women? And we thought the most interesting thing would be if that affects whether they want to have a child or not. Does magazine exposure affect women's fertility desires? Do they want to have more babies? Do they want to have them sooner? They're watching or looking at all these. I just checked out the Revista, Stan, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> and there's all these women's magazines. It looks very much like, the, like in the States or in Germany. And they're all about, this is what you're supposed to be like, you're beautiful and um, perfect mother, blah, blah, blah. And we thought, well, it would be so interesting if making them read these magazines for a week would affect when they want to have a child, whether they want to pursue a career. So that's what we did. We did a prolonged exposure experiment and had them either look at career portrayals of women, which was very difficult to find, 
Um, the business women are very rare in American magazines or beauty magazines or parenting magazines. And we were able to show the stereotyped um, portrayals of women. They wanted to have babies sooner and more of them <laughs> compared to the baseline. I'm not really sure in hindsight where that intuition came from, but we were able to demonstrate it. The trick was then, why is that happening? How can these stupid magazines affect what you want to do with your life? I mean, that's, it's just wild in a way. Um, so we, we compared different patterns. We wanted to see whether social cognitive theory um, works or whether it was more or less priming. Now I'm blanking on the third. I think the third was social identity, whether they are more or less um, uh, affiliating with the social group of mothers, of models, or whatever. And it was not, we could not really find a good solid process. We had the effect, and we could not really say, this is how it's happening. If you can say also how it's happening, you're in such, in a much stronger position. So keep thinking about why something is happening. If you can say why, that's a really big bonus. Not just test theory, all these theories that I just mentioned would pretty much predict the same. If you, if you uh, compare socially with them, if you use social cognitive theory, all these pr uh, theories would predict the same thing. But when you ask them, okay, did you feel affiliated? Did you um, feel similar and all that? You could possibly tackle what the process is, but it was not a statistically significant um, pattern there. So that was my example, my little detour. Think about the process, why something is happening, why you can demonstrate um, this effect. Um, questions, comments, any of that? I feel like I'm going to talk forever if I go continue at this pace. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. Um, I think on the, one of the earlier slides I mentioned also, how can you complement the existing research? One way is method. Like, I think a big, big component of my career was that I focused on selective exposure. Um, I study pretty much why people choose certain messages. The computer came in very handy. <laughs> I've been spending a lot of time programming stuff when I started out. So this methodological approach to track why people pick a particular message was my big, my big plus, and I'll be forever indebted to Dolph Zillman who told me, hey, this, you can program this thing? This is really awesome. You need to do this in your career. Okay, and here I go, still. Um, so that's another thing, I don't know, uh, it's probably somewhere on my slides. Work with people who know what's going on. I think that's the biggest, the smartest thing that you could ever do. If someone is willing to work with you and knows a lot, suck it up and learn, pick the brain of the person, forget your pride, <laughs> and you better learn as much as you can from someone who's know, who knows how this business is working. I think that's the, that's going back to my first slide, that's the easy way. Everything else is going to be so much harder. If you try it yourself, ooh, my god, <laughs> so much more difficult. So I think Dolph Zillman, as my mentor, was a big, big, was just the slide into this. So and he, he made me study this, if, if you will. But methods is a big, that's where I wanted to go originally, is very important and can be um, the trajectory that you bring to the table. Maybe people have always studied something. Um, with surveys, now you want to do experimentation, or in a particular field nobody has ever studied choice that I don't, I almost don't have to think about uh, whether I bring something new because choice is so rarely studied. So that's a big um, advantage. If you have some new methodological angle, that's just awesome. So think about the methodology. Um, and then, um, at least for me, that was a big learning experience compared to my, my German um, academic socialization. Um, we took some stuff for granted, if you will. I can give you an example. Uh, for, for those journals, the top tier journals, you need to prove every little detail, every little claim needs to have a manipulation check. And you would not even anticipate some of these, but you need to think about any possible criticism that people might bring to the table you're thinking that this message represents X, think again, how can you prove it? Go back and double check, do your manipulation check. So let me give you an example for the study that I mentioned earlier. We used these images, um, magazine pages of, from parenting magazines, from beauty magazines, and from business career magazines. 
And we just assumed that people would put those into those categories. And the reviewers we better go back. Is this really right that you're what you're assuming? And you would say, of course. You see, this is a this is a woman with a child. Of course, this needs to be, that's a parenting portrayal. And darn it, those reviewers were right. When you ask women how beautiful are they, how motherly are they, the, the parenting portrayals, these women are just as photoshopped <laughs> as the models. So it, what we assumed was not all correct. You have to ask people in a very particular way, is this a, a portrayal of mother, of, of a beauty model? And then you get the categorizations that, that we were after. But when you just have people rate how beautiful is this person, the mothers are just as photoshopped as, <laughs> as this, I don't know, 16-year-old, super thin, whatever. Um, so yeah, sometimes you assume things that are not obvious, and you need to have proof for every little thing under the sun that people could possibly think of. Oh, and that's, that's a lot of work. Like half of the work that I put in a study is often pre-testing messages, developing messages, making sure people interpret the questions the way we think they will. So that's, it's a lot of work. I sometimes wonder why my students still love me. <laughs> I'm not sure, because I make them work very hard. I, I'm, I'm sometimes thinking, why would they work with me if they have to do so much <laughs> to begin with? And they sometimes say, oh, I never want to do this again, Sylvia, which I understand. But then they get published, and they'll do it again. Um, so yeah, pretest messages, manipulations, reliability of your measures. Um, I think it's also important to think about the research design, causal claims. Um, experimentation is big. Um, surveys are still big. So uh, I think it is a lot more difficult to publish content analyses, focus groups, qualitative work in, the, in those journals. It's a lot more difficult. I'll, I'll, hmm? It's impossible? Yeah, yeah I, I trust you. I, I, I have not tried it, and I think it's going to be very, I don't see any in these. No. Journal of Communication, I don't, it's probably been years. Yeah. Content analysis, maybe there was one on news or something, but that's also been a long time. <laughs> Are you doing qualitative work or content analysis? Or? Yeah. <laughs> no longer, <laughs> is that what you're saying? <laughs> it, it is, yeah. I don't think I've seen any, any, anything along these lines lately in any of these journals. So, and they have their, I don't know what to say. I mean, there's a certain bias, if you will. That stuff is really difficult to publish in those journals. And part of it is because you can't prove some of these things so easily in a focus group. How do, you can't have a manipulation check and all these. They just like to see all these little ornaments what they're worth, I don't know, but um, uh, 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 uh. so I think causal claims are a big issue. Uh, whether you, if you can establish causality, that's a big uh, plus. So do an experimentation or a longitudinal study that will help you big time. Quality of the sample. I've just we've just submitted something to the political to the journal called Political Communication. They gave us a desk reject because it was a student sample, college students. I'm like, oh, good, okay, whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's gonna be rough in the States. You do a lot of college student samples, and I totally agree, huge problems. But if they cut that, it's gonna be a problem. <laughs> but yeah, so sometimes the quality of the sample will be um, important, uh, is an important consideration, obviously. Then one thing that is now coming up more and more, at least for media psychology, and we've just had a publication come out that is just looking at that. Um, now this will take me some time to unfold it, I guess, um, because we are very much used to thinking, hey, let's study a lot of people. Oftentimes, you'll do an experiment, show them maybe one movie, one commercial, and see how they respond. But how much does this commercial or movie represent all the movies, all the commercials that are out there? So we are really looking at just one message sometimes to establish some sort of process. So I think at Media Psychology at least, no longer. I've just rejected and she probably had me forever, but she had just one ad and wanted to get this published, showed a 
an amazing process and all that. But it was just one ad. Can't do. If, if it's working for one ad, we don't know. The next ad might not do. It might be a total fluke. So I, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I made her do, uh, I had her collect more data. So she used three at the end. But then um, the ads were almost exactly the same. <laughs> So the ads were like, just the same ad, just with a different person. So I'm like, no, sorry, this is not, still not representing what's out there in terms of ads. So she's probably going to hate me forever. But when I said, please collect more stimuli or use more stimuli, I did not anticipate that it would be just almost the same ad. Oh, so it's, it, it was difficult. But I'm trying to warn you. <laughs> Use diversity in the stimuli that you like. You're using all these different real, uh, it's very hard. So dealing with the diversity of stimuli is hard, but it will, I think, get more and more important. So have several news articles, or I don't know what specifically you're studying, or movies. Or, and with movies, I don't even know how to <laughs> handle it, because you cannot use like 20 different ones. So maybe three, or I don't know, or focus on a particular genre at least, because you cannot possibly have people watch 20 different movies, and I don't know. So it's, it's, I don't know where this is going, but just as a heads up, diversity and stimuli, I think, will become more and more important. And will be another big bonus if you can claim, hey, we have considered that there's diversity in these stimuli out there. Um, so at least at Ohio State, the stats instruction is, is tough, and the students are <laughs> crying over it, but I think in the long run, statistics, super important for those journals. They love their advanced stats. And again, the processes. Um, I, think, I think oftentimes this last thing here, how something happens, you need advanced statistics. So whenever you're not reading a theory article, <laughs> take a stats class, if you will, I, if, if your goal is to get into these journals. I think the stats are a big, and we make our students study or, or take a lot of these classes. And it's, it's painful, depending on your math abilities or willingness to. But if you can then eventually demonstrate the process, it's like this big light bulb. So then it's going to pay off. <laughs> All the blood, sweat, and tears invested in statistics will eventually pay off then. Um, do you have questions, comments for me? I never, I never get this much attention. Like, this is weird. <laughs> See, nobody ever listens so closely to me. Oh, God. Let me know if, if you want me to. But I'm taking a lot of, I have no idea what time it is. So I'm just chatting away and hope that you will keep me on the right track. OK, guys? Okay. Um, Sometimes underestimated, or probably a lot of times underestimated. I see a lot of submissions as an editor. They're like, ah. <laughs> you're like, oh, please. If this is a job interview, would you show up without a tie? No, right? As a guy, at least, or whatever. Like, you want to look perfect if you want to get the job. Your paper needs to look perfect. I end up sending out a lot of papers that are, they go through administrative processing. We make sure they're blind. Uh, so anonymous and all that. But then it's not perfect APA style. Some of it's not double spaced. And if you've reviewed and read and written a lot of papers, these things just fly in your face. If it's not perfectly APA, you're like, wait, what? This person doesn't know what's going on. So you, are, you start off with a stereotype. Think about it this way. It's like you wouldn't show up for a job interview with bad hair, like on a bad hair day. Like, so you need to look perfect. So, and that's one of the easier things, if you will. So just make it perfect APA style. That's like the easiest of the whole game. But I see so many papers that I'm like, wait, why are you doing this to yourself? You worked so hard on this, and now you show up in your pajama, if you will. So please don't do it. Um, so thinking back about the writing style that I saw in Germany, or still see when I read those uh, book chapters and what have you. I think, in my impression at least, the European writing style is a lot more, OK, let's think about this. Let's consider this and that and this perspective and what have you. Don't do that. 
you have your argument. You go there. Don't, don't just sort of chit chat here and there. I know it's important, it would be great. The, paper, the journals don't have the space and you want to present an argument again, perfectly persuasive style. This is what's going on. You know all the answers. You're at least pretending that you have it all figured out. Nobody has, seriously. So, but you want to look perfect. You want to make it look impeccable. No problem whatsoever. I don't think the perfect study will ever exist, but you need to make it look like it's perfect. Nothing ever went wrong. If anything ever went wrong, don't mention it. They might ask you and then you're down, but try to make it look as perfect as possible, which takes me to when you, when you uh, prepare your project, you also need to aim for perfection. I was gonna say shit will happen anyway, but <laughs> so try to make it perfect as you start out because little problems will come up anyways, things that you did not anticipate. So put all the work that you can into your manipulation checks or the stimulant development into your survey design and what have you. I mean, I torture my students with proofreading of the survey, of the instructions, of the questionnaire. I want all these things to be perfect. That already affects the the data quality that you get, if your questionnaire has little typos, you might think, oh, nobody will notice. Your respondents will notice. You want to have perfect, like they will see whether you spend a lot of time and care with your study. So even that, I think, needs to be as close to perfection as you can get it. And that sort of continues then later on with your write-up. Um, proofread it four times, at least, different people. So. The goal is perfection because problems will come up anyways. And you need to, you're in the persuasion business, if you will. You want to make it look perfect. This is the best piece that you ever see as a reviewer. Like, oh, whoa, this is really great. They will still come up with problems. We'll have all kinds of opinions. So don't give them any opportunity to find issues, if you will. Um, please help. Yeah, please. Thank you. I'm like, this is so one way. This is strange. Yeah. So I have questions regarding the last uh, line. You talk about, uh, basically, you talk about the survey. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably, I'm sure you know what are the bias related to surveys and the answers of people in these surveys. So You're talking about self-reports? For instance, mm -hmm. yeah. And, well, five years ago, Solution to everything, yeah. However, after four years doing it in uh, some papers about the third person effect, the professional mm -hmm. the effect, I realized that I was doing what I was doing was not that good, yeah? Asking all the time to students and yeah. some uh, journals uh, refused, started refusing this kind mm -hmm. of. How to invest your time to, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. Because all I did just four years ago is nothing right now. <laughs> this is my feeling, probably I have a bias. Well, let's, let's try to make a, get to a more positive feeling then. Um, let me, let's see. I think with all these very advanced methods, um, nobody can do these, met all of them. So I think the first decision that you need to make is what is the method that you believe in? Like, if you believe in self-reports, 
go for that. If you think the topic that you're studying, um, people are able to access what they're doing through self-reports, through questionnaires, then pursue it. There's still a large section communication research they will totally go with self-reports. I don't believe in self-reports as, as like personally. I believe in observation. I would not, whenever I can, I will avoid self-reports, but there's still a large section that goes with that. Um, but then there are all these fancy physio, psycholo psychophysiological measures, neuroimaging, and all kinds of things. I don't think anybody can do all these things, so you want to s focus on the method that you believe in, if you want to study anything along these lines, find someone to work with because life is too short to learn all these methods. If you can focus on some really important statistics, they will get you um, to a lot of different destinations. But let's say collecting physio data, very hard, very time consuming. Neuroimaging, wow, all the money you need, it's, it's big. So that's a huge decision. I get the kind of question a lot, like, should I study physio? If you want to invest several years, go for it. If you believe this is what is the future, go for it. But you need to be prepared for a long learning curve, and it will take a long time. I think for someone who's, I don't know where you are, doctoral or what, but for a student, a doctoral student, I would probably suggest um, Start with easier methods that will pay off more, uh, more, more quickly. Um, but now you ask, well, they want this kind of fancy stuff. But I think you still get a long way with advanced stats that don't necessarily involve physio or, or other really um, involved methods. But theory or innovative questions, uh, addressing important societal questions, still, there's so much to be done still. I think the big creative ideas will still get you very far. So I don't think you need to go into, I don't know, neuroimaging or whatever you have in mind. We don't have to all do saliva testing. So we don't have to worry about all this. Self-reports or neuroimaging or what kind of science? Whatever neurogenetics uh, uh, could col colonize our... No, I don't think so it's going to... If you read a uh, journal of communication, probably you think that they will... I think there's still a lot of diversity. You, yeah. There is content analyses, there's a lot of surveys, there's a lot of experiments. I think what the, the examples that you mentioned, they stand out because they are so unusual. But when you would, I think if you were to count how many experiments or multiple studies within one publication, but these might be experiments, several experiments on the same topic, but no neuroimaging or whatever. I think those kind of examples stand out more because they're unusual, but I don't think they're anywhere close to taking over. I know like um, some of the Dutch researchers using this, but overall, I don't see that taking over, <coughs> so not to worry too much. <laughs> I do think that the self-reports are sort of losing ground. We want to have more observational data. We less and less just rely on people, hey, why do you think you're doing this? I don't think we know. I don't know why I'm watching particular, in that particular moment. So, <laughs> um, But I don't, I'm not that worried about 
those kinds of methods taking over. And the people who use them often work with experts in that, in that field. Like I'm, I'm working with people from dietetics on food intake, how that might be affected by media use. And I need people who know how to ask about food intake because that's a science in itself. So you need to work interdisciplinarily, I guess, if you want to use those. And those folks do that. It's not that they're like, ooh, all of a sudden pulling the neuroimaging out of the head. And I hope that helps. <laughs> um, other comments, questions, maybe? Um, so no detours, if you will. <sighs> Who's going to read it? <laughs> Blink. Who's going to be your re reviewers? You can influence who's going to review your work. Make sure you cite them. As an editor, like, oh gosh, who could I ask to look at this? So you will look at the people who are cited. You will do a little search on if you, if you don't know right away who's an expert in that field. You will look at who has been cited and then it will browse and Google a little bit. But you have some sort of influence, if you will. You can hopefully shape a little bit who's going to review what you're doing. And oftentimes I already designed the studies with those folks in mind. Like what is their thing and what might they ask? What might be their criticism? Yep, I know. It sounds like, oh my god, <laughs> all these people out there. Do I need to know them and worry about them even before I've done? Yeah, in a way that would be helpful. And again, I think that's where if Listen, <laughs> if you can work with someone who's an expert in that field and has gone through all these troubles, that will help you. So that's stuff that you cannot know if you start out. If you've just received your doctoral degree, it takes years. So if you can work with people who um, have that kind of experience and know the folks in the field, that's so much easier. I don't know how soon you need to be independent here in Spain. I mean, for American. Uh, assistant professors, they are forced to become very independent quickly. That can be hard. Um, oh yeah, this is, I think I'm saying this quite a bit now. There's a lot of subtleties. Again, if you use different terms, you will bring different people to the table. Different reviewers will show up. If I say uses and gratifications, certain people will come to the table. If I say Selective media use, I'm much more likely to be invited to review. So even though it could be almost the same study, so the terms are often already implying certain things. And again, that's depending on where you are in your career, that might be difficult to know. But if you have someone who is an expert in the field, um, that might help or will help greatly. Um, is there a non-native speaker disadvantage? Yes, and I know from first-hand experience there is one. <laughs> it's, it's much harder. I mean, there's no question about it. Just face it, it's, it's difficult. It's more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Very expensive because you have to pay. Yeah. Well, just spend a year, invest a whole year of your life or more and go. <laughs> yeah. I think, again, if you can, that's maybe something to think about also. Um, and I was asking, are there any funds to go abroad, or can you maybe team up with, yeah, I know some of you have been to Missouri, or I don't know where, all these different locations. But if you can find someone who's, who's interested in the same topic, that's such a big bonus. I've never paid anybody. I've always begged and invited for lunch. <laughs> Because you will know so much, you will learn a lot more. And again, a professional translator might not know the terms. So even then, if you pay a lot of money, they will not use the right terms. So it's frustrating. Yeah, translation doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. I think that's really the conclusion. You have to make friends. You have to make friends. There's no other way. Because trans a translator won't know. They won't use the right terms. They don't know the methods, they don't know the theories, there's just no way that they could truly help you. And I know it's totally unfair. It is. So for Americans it's a lot easier, or from the UK, yeah. How can I twist this to a positive note? <laughs> I think it does hopefully force you to make connections. That's the only way really to go about it. You need to be realistic about it. It's, I don't think it's possible. And I, I mentioned Dolph Zillman earlier. He spent so much time with me and taught me, you need someone who's willing to sit down. It's a nightmare to, 
to the and I don't think you can, it's, it's almost impossible to succeed because if you use a translator, it is, I, I don't know, I, I've never. So I did the drastic thing. I left my husband behind, went for a postdoc in the States, didn't know anybody. I don't know what, what, what I was thinking, but. <laughs> so I wanted to learn it, I guess. And at the time, I, I, again, I did not understand all the full applications. I wanted my gold star, I think. And <laughs> But you don't know all the things ahead of time. But it was the best investment ever because I had someone who was willing to sit down with me and teach me all the, all the details. So if, if you have someone who's willing to spend some time with you, go for it because that's the best investment and the best. Someone who's really willing to mentor you, it's, it's a big, big um, help and just the best thing you can ever do. Um, was that positive enough? I hope. <laughs> I know it's hard. There's just no question about it. In this case, you signed together with this friend who had you. Um, author? You mean co-author yes. together? Um, it depends. Usually, yes. Um, I mean, I think, again, that's one of the best ways of going about it. Um, if you find someone who's interested in the same topic, design the study together, maybe, or I just had the other day an email from the University of Valencia, they want to replicate a study that I did. So I send them my stimuli, I send them my questionnaire, they do apparently the same thing pretty much. Um, in, that, in that case, they are going all by themselves, but if, if a doctoral student would want to do something that I'm interested in and maybe work with my doctoral student, maybe the two can, can team up and uh, help each other, if you will. It's good for my doctoral student, might get an additional publication and helps, the per yeah, and then they would be co-authors. So yeah, I think oftentimes it's, it, it was like that, but I've also just begged people to proofread my work and they were not even interested in the topic. And it, it, so it could go either way. Um, let's see what else. So I don't know, is this, I'm already at the point where you submit it. <laughs> and now you get feedback. Do you have any questions or on the prep stuff? So um, let's just say you've invested all the time and you've collected the data and you've spent a lot of money on lunches and I don't know what. So, um, so you get your reviews back. Hopefully you got an R&R. &R. Um, if that happens, that's awesome. Um, and now, if you get criticized for your work, no worries. <laughs> I mean, at least the way when I, when I read um, the reviews, I, I don't know enough about the Spanish culture and subtleties, but in America, everybody's always perfectly polite. Mm -hmm. No one ever says anything negative until you get the reviews. And they slap you in the face, and they put you down, a fatal flaw, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, I've done nothing right in this project. Take it with, <laughs> stand tall if you can, <laughs> take rest or whatever, lie down for an hour, that's all right. Um, but you've got an R&R. &R. Swallow your pride, do everything they tell you. And I know sometimes for me it's a big thing to swallow. I mean, I'm proud of my project, but you do whatever they ask you to do. If there's any way, accommodate what they want. Uh, sometimes they don't even know what they're talking about. They don't understand the statistics. They don't understand the theory. They have no idea what's going on. Or one reviewer asks the opposite of the other. <laughs> it's bizarre sometimes. It's okay. You want to get published. <laughs> don't worry about it. You don't have to have lunch with them. <laughs> so you don't even know who that is. So take it, stand tall if you can. Don't argue. Do whatever they tell you if, if there's any way. I mean, sometimes you'd go like, yeah, but this was addressed by doing blah, blah, blah. <laughs> sometimes it's not possible because they might even ask you opposite things, but try to make it sound as if you did exactly what they wanted you to do. <laughs> um, so I teach my students always a certain style of writing a revision memo, um, and I'm very, very like adamant about it. I know there's a lot of different styles of writing a revision memo. My style is you just say, um, changed as requested, done as blah, 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 very neutral. I never say I or we. Everything happens magically, was addressed, was resolved, clarity was improved, whatever. It's all passive voice. 
because I never want to hear from them again. <laughs> I don't want to engage them in a conversation. I just want to tell them, done, leave me alone. It's a subtext, OK? So don't say anything like, thank you. Thank you for the compliment. No. Make it as boring, and hopefully they will not even take the time to read it, OK? Gosh, this is all getting taped. <laughs> So that's the idea, you know? You don't want to engage them in a conversation. You just want them to give that they know the person did everything as requested, and they let you go, hopefully. Um, so be very neutral in your revision memo. So, OK. Do you have questions? Yeah. Yes. Could you prefer the different thousand after revision, they say, okay, you need two more uh, theory or more stuff. Yeah. And the uh, final paper has 8,000 words. Mm -hmm. And the uh, review say, okay, not possible. Okay. You mean when, you, when it's longer than what yeah, the journal allows? The review, reviewers say, uh, add something. Uh, spend, something. spend three days and make it shorter. <laughs> I mean, I go through every sentence, oh, this word could be cut. Oh, this reference could be cut. I sit for hours and to do what they want me to do. You just do it. I mean, there's, I, it's, and I know sometimes it seems like completely impossible. I've, I've just gotten something accepted, and I worked with that uh, on that with um, two scholars from the University of Amsterdam, no, Free University of Amsterdam, and they were like, "This is not possible. This, I know, we make it possible. <laughs> you cut this this beast down to what they want you." To. So you can cut another part of the paper. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, you'd be, I don't know, but. I think the concise writing style, and I often feel like, this is perfect. But when they force me, I'll find something that I'll drop. You know, you just have to. I know, sometimes it's like, this is all important. This all needs to be said. But you take the knife and cut the rip out if need be. You know. um, other <laughs> questions or comments? Gosh, I hope this is never going to get don't put it on YouTube. Well, I want you forever. <laughs> um, OK, do you want me to proceed to? Thank you. Um, so let's see. I have no idea what time it is. Am I? I have 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. So let me see. How much more did I? Yeah, I was, I'm getting close. So let's say you got rejected. No worries. Look at the reviews, see what is really, thank you, what substance is in there. Do you agree with the criticism? Should be changed? Um, so you have um, several options, if you will. A lot of my colleagues just say, don't worry about it, resubmit it elsewhere. I don't do that. I never do that because the likelihood is pretty high that the same reviewers will get this. Yeah, and then like, what? You didn't do what I wanted. You didn't, you didn't even. So you better <laughs> change things at least a little bit. Um, so I always try to accommodate, even though I don't get to resubmit. I try to um, make sure it's not the exact same thing. And I try to, whatever is meaningful and useful, I try to accommodate in what I send elsewhere then. But don't, don't, don't get stressed out. I get rejected. Everybody gets rejected. It's part of the business. Don't feel, don't get frustrated. It's normal. You get rejected left and right. Live with it. It's just what it is. So I got so many times rejected. <laughs> it's OK. You'll get there eventually. Um, but sometimes you need to be able to let go. Even if this was your master thesis, if there is a fatal flaw or if it's just something that those journals are not interested in, you are wasting your time if you keep hammering, if you keep resubmitting. So sometimes you just need to let go and maybe think about, OK, what's the project that I can design and place? Because they will like it. There's a gap in the literature. And just design that project. Maybe you've learned the hard way from this first attempt. Just go for the learning experience. Forget about the thing that is not apparently publishable and try something new. So that's what I mean with let go. Often it's just a waste of time. And you want to get this master thesis or whatever published or your dissertation. Sometimes it's not worth it. It's usually not the best thing you've ever done. Oh, certainly not in my case. I think this dissertation was just one step along the way. So yeah, I think this was sort of what I had on that. Because 
you can never fully know how things will pan out. I think it's best if you have several irons in the fire. Try to develop several projects. Often there's a waiting time spent in a project. During that, you try to think, crank up the next thing. So ideally, have several irons in the fire because it's unpredictable how long it will take to get published, how many times you will have to resubmit or whatever. Um, and as I said earlier, aim for perfection. Problems will come up anyways. Try to make it as perfect as you can. I know that's sort of like, I'm never gonna be good enough, but try, shoot high, aim high. I think it's necessary. Um, still need to be patient. Don't get frustrated. It's not worth it. Try to enjoy the ride. Try to uh, look at the learning experience. Eventually it will pay off. At least I think if you, if you follow these sort of rules, eventually <laughs> research gods will show mercy <laughs> and get you out there. Um, and you need to wrap your mind around the fact it's a social system. It's, I think it's the best we have. Um, I'd much rather go with the peer review system than any of the like old boys club deciding what's going to get published. So this is the best system that we have. Um, even though often it will feel unfair, it's unpredictable. That's why you need several projects. Um, and often it will be an individual taste that's affecting the decision and will cost like, several months in the process. It's not always, it's often not fair, for sure. So just try to shrug it off <laughs> and look at the bright side. I think it's the best um, system that we have. I'd much, rather, uh, I'd much rather go with that system as opposed to certain people who have been doing the same thing deciding what's gonna get published. Um, I think <laughs> that's what I had. Thank you so much. Before I turn this off, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what happened when the reviewers don't agree? Uh, this is your, what is your function in this case? I sleep on it. I think over. Sometimes I just get a third reviewer. If it's so difficult for me to decide, if it's not, often you won't have enough expertise. So I'd rather get a third reviewer. Like in this case that I mentioned earlier with the stimuli, I got an additional reviewer and this person said, hey, this is just this kind of product area. Why don't you study perfume and other things? I'm like, oh, thank God, I'm not the only person thinking this way. So sometimes you have to make a call, but if you feel like you can't with a good, like uh, if you feel too uncertain, you get another, an additional reviewer. It takes more time, but it's better than, uh, <laughs> you need to have a good rationale to decide. I have a question also. Do you, have, do you think it's a good idea to send during the GIS to the abstract of the paper to an editor? Because I sometimes get that, yeah. Time, yeah. Uh, to send the paper, yeah. review or not. If the editor yes. say, okay, that's the good project or something like that. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Um, if you're worried about that, I would probably do that. Um, I sometimes almost feel as if people are trying to impress me favorably, but that won't happen. I don't think that this, but if you're worried that it would just get stuck for a long time, that might be a good, but at least for our case, if I see it's not a good fit, I'll just desk reject it and it wouldn't take long. So it shouldn't take long, but often it will, depending on the journal. Yeah, but very few people do that, actually. I don't get that a whole lot. Yes? Thank you. Um, do whatever, whenever they ask you to review, review. I am like, <laughs> sure. Even though it does, because the next time you'll maybe be the submitting author. And as I said, it's a social system. I don't think, I mean, you want to be totally neutral, but editors are people. I will remember whether somebody told me, no, I'm busy. <laughs> so it's just a human system, if you will. I, and the other thing that I mentioned earlier, you learn so much. You learn, you review whenever you can, unless it's really outside of your expertise or it's a journal that you never you don't even read or you would never submit your work. But whenever all these journals ask me, I still review like religiously. People are like, what, why, what, 
but sure, you do that. That's, it's not only, your, I mean, it's sort of paying back, but you learn so much and you please people and you want to do that. I mean, they are probably more willing to give me good feedback if I'm always like, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you recommend to market in our research. Mm -hmm. How do you market your research? With a good title? How do you uh -huh. do it? Um, when I said market your research, take this persuasive attitude, uh, um, well, I think that's, it's, it's that attitude that you need to make it look perfect. Don't try to argue this is important. You need to make it look perfect and look at it as a persuasive endeavor. But the title is part of it. You don't want to be too catchy. Um, I think what I meant with that is mostly try to convince people. Think about that, you're, that you need to convince people to like that project. Um, because when you start to do research, it's often, oh, I want to resolve, I want to solve this problem. So you, I want to walk through all the details. All of it, it's everything, it's all of it. Um, oftentimes you want, um, as, when you start out, you want to discuss all the problems, all the things that you considered when you did your project, when you prepared it. Maybe you want to put all the references that you read. That's way too much. So whatever did not work out, don't ever mention. Everything was perfect from the beginning. You'd make no mistakes, even though that never happens. You know, you drop all the stuff that, do, that don't, anything that does not look perfect, you would not put. Nobody wants to read that. You want to, like, the super polished, perfect bone. And oftentimes you have maybe done three studies to get there, or pretests, or pilots, or whatever. I know it's so painful, but it needs to look perfect, and then you get through. Thank you so much for your, for your time and your questions. <laughs>